Denise Flum has disappeared. Denise is an 18-year-old star student athlete at Connersville High School. It was a mysterious disappearance, and few clues have been found. We had people coming forward, and they would talk about the three names that kept popping up. These guys might be involved. We've interviewed some of the most dangerous people in the world, and I can't remember ever being that sort of nervous around somebody. We were looking for Benny. He wasn't the guy that you wanted to cross because he wasn't mentally always sound. Are you sure you have some type of protection on you? <sighs> we are hoping to chat with Randy for a minute. Maybe what's the door name? Uh, no, because they're actually scared of you. I do think it's a solvable case. There was that thought that he's confessing. Maybe we can finally get to the bottom of this. The 18-year-old was last seen on Good Friday back in 1986. Whenever there are rivers flying around, there's always some truth in them. And these guys have gotten away with it. What happened to her? Where is she? Was she kidnapped, murdered? Is she being held against her will? Or as David and Judy Flum hope every day, will their daughter Denise miraculously return home just as mysteriously as she disappeared on Good Friday, 1986? I want you to call Denise. I, I love you, and your mother too loves you. After all these years, what happened to her? You know, it's just not right that we've gone this long with no answers. You know, it's, it's very hard on a family to not know what happened to your daughter. Where is she? It's been more than 30 years since Judy and David Flum's daughter went missing. They've been tirelessly searching for her since, pressuring local law enforcement and working on their own to keep Denise's disappearance on the minds of everyone in Connorsville. We're here to uh, put this up, hopefully on the window to hopefully re-engage the community in a uh, reward poster for our daughter. Okay. Police had extensively questioned Denise's ex-boyfriend, Sean McClung, just a month prior, but they didn't have enough evidence to charge him. Connorsville native and out-of-town detective Stacy Reese was determined to keep the pressure on. My name is Stacy Reese. We're going around putting up posters for Denise, reward posters, oh, and we're okay. wondering if we could put one up here. Sure, yeah. We're just going to go to different businesses in town, and the goal is to put them up in places that our suspects are going to go to, um, especially Sean McClung, Denise's boyfriend. So, yeah, it's kind of a, I believe you did this, and I want you to have to look at her when you go places, because you should have to look at her. I hope it disturbs him. I hope it makes him nervous. Even though the case is more than 30 years old, it seems like everyone in town has something to say about Denise Flum. I heard names that flew around, but you know, no names I want to say, there's, there's rumors. I just heard about them disappearing and then I heard they found bones. One thing that I can say about being from a small town Whenever there are rumors flying around, they're never 100% accurate, but there's always some truth in them. While the case has never gone away, in 2018, a single Facebook post by Detective Reese kicked off a new phase of the investigation. She was turning 50, and I thought, well, you know, why not put something out there, maybe get some attention to it? So I made a Facebook post about Denise Flum, how she would have been 50. Um, and it kind of went viral pretty quickly for around here. Within 24 hours, tips started rolling in directly to Detective Reese. Suddenly, everyone in town was talking about this 30-year-old cold case as if it had just happened. 
I think Stacy's involvement did light a fire under the sheriff's department and the city police department. This is the justice for Denise Page. It was a page that, uh, with the Flum's permission, started a couple months ago just to make sure to keep attention um, focused on Denise because in a missing person case, uh, attention is important. It got the sheriff's attention uh, and they weren't happy about my post. There have been times where they've called my chief um, to tell me, you know, they wanted me to kind of back off that I was uh, interfering with what they were doing. This is the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do to help the Flum family. Denise Flum. Denise Flum has mattered to me since I was a three-year-old child, and she means something, and what happened to her was wrong. I'm a female law enforcement officer. I face this crap all the time. It is what it is. If they do come after me for it, I'll face the consequences. Stacy was the most help to us. She just was. She got a lot of information that nobody else could get. I just think she's a darn good detective. I think she's got more experience and she's smarter than most of the cops that have worked the case. Through the justice page, Detective Reese has drawn attention to Sean. At the same time, he's also become a focus for local law enforcement, maybe for the first time in this whole investigation. In part, that's because for a long time, police had their eye on someone else. So with your initial investigation, uh, they focused on someone right away. Who did they focus on? They focused on Benny Johnson. Benny Johnson is a Connorsville local and graduated a few years before Denise. We tracked down his court records, and since 1986, the year that Denise went missing, it turns out that he's had quite a few legal problems. He's been arrested multiple times and convicted of crimes like attempted battery on a police officer, resisting law enforcement, and trespassing. Johnson family is a pretty big family in Fayette County. Uh, they, they have a lot of wealth. They own factories, um, farmland. Benny was a little bit of an outcast, but still kind of popular back in his day. As far as I know, the only time Denise was around Benny was when she was with Sean. During the first two weeks when Denise was missing, just when Benny Johnson called us and said he wanted to talk to us. When we arrived, there was the newspaper laying on the front porch <clears throat> Denise's picture's on the front page. And it was almost like he put it there on purpose so we could see it. Maybe he didn't, but it just seemed strange to me. You know, Benny, for whatever reason, he, he brought a lot of attention to himself. He was very calm and casual and relaxed. But he did say, I didn't kill your daughter and we weren't sure she was dead. Then probably within the first couple of weeks after Denise disappeared, he had been arrested on the north end of town. He was intoxicated when they arrested him. And he was ranting and raving and saying, you stupid cops don't even know where Denise, you're so stupid, you can't find Denise Flum or something to that effect. And that was a surprise to everyone, us, the police department. Benny was not being interrogated by, about Denise. He volunteered, he brought her into the conversation. It wasn't just that one time. According to investigators' notes from the early 90s, Benny allegedly confessed to killing Denise to more than a dozen people. There's multiple statements from people that indicate Benny Johnson's involvement, which I will actually show you. Benny told this person that a year prior he had killed Denise at the cabin, which Johnson's family did own a cabin. And this one was disturbing, is that he can see Denise laying on the ground and saying, help me, help me. And he's laughing about it as he's telling her. They overheard him talking about how he killed Denise, that he had cut her throat that he dismembered her, that, you know, like she's been fed to the hogs. He, he has multiple stories of how he's killed Denise. And 
I mean, there are there's so many witnesses who have heard this from him. It's common knowledge in Carnersville. When you when you talk to people in Carnersville and you talk to them about Denise Flum, most people in Carnersville will tell you Benny Johnson. We started hearing the claims that Benny was making within a couple of weeks from the time she disappeared. Sometimes when he talks about it, he's almost bragging to scare them. Like, I did this and I can do it again. But other times he's like blubbering and he's crying and he's so upset that he was involved in it. These confessions are disturbing, but maybe what's more shocking is that police told us that Benny has never been officially questioned about them. To try to understand how that's possible, we spent months trying to track down people who said he confessed. Many were scared to talk on camera, but one guy who knew Benny in the 80s agreed to meet us at a local bar. Hang out with like Benny Johnson and that crew. I partied with him uh, quite a few times, actually. Mm, what was he like? He's out there. Just mm-hmm. seems a little crazy at times and stuff, you know. You know, I've heard him say it at least probably three times, at least that he killed her. Benny told you that he killed Denise Vaughn. Well, he didn't actually just tell me. I mean, there was other people there. He was just, I've heard him say it two or three times, that he killed her. But you never knew if he was serious or not. Why would he say something like that? Like, why would he ever admit to that? I don't know. He he was usually laughing when he'd say it. Did you believe him? At the time, no, but now, I don't know. Is someone telling other people they did it enough to arrest them? No, but it's enough to start looking at them. Do you think you'd talk to us? I think it's worth a shot for you to try to talk to him, yes. We were looking for Benny. They fed her to the hogs, and just would cover his ears and say he could hear her scream. A straight-A student at Connorsville High School, Denise is active in sports, has scholarships waiting for her, and the prom to look forward to. But at about noon last Friday, Denise left her home and hasn't been seen since. A mystery baffling even the experts. In March 1986, Denise Flum left her home to go find her purse that she left at a party the night before. She hasn't been seen since. After all these years, police think she was killed. And there's a guy in town who a lot of people say has admitted to it. His name is Benny Johnson. In addition to the alleged confessions, there's another possible connection between Benny and Denise's disappearance. One of the only clues police have is her car, found blocked and abandoned on a small gravel lane just outside town. The place where Denise's car was found has never made a lot of sense to investigators. It was located four miles past the party site on an old farm lane that led to an abandoned barn. It's not the kind of place you just accidentally wind up at. You'd have to know the area. Ben Johnson grew up around here. His grandpa owned several acres out here west of town. Then I thought, well, maybe Benny was in on it because who's going to think to put that car clear back there by that barn? A little part of me thinks that she went there to ask for help and walked in on something bad. Detectives were looking into Benny back in 1986, but they didn't bring him in for questioning, and it's unclear how hard they pushed. To my knowledge, we've never, no detective or any investigators ever interviewed Benny Johnson in relation to this case. His family hired a lawyer. Unless police have enough evidence to charge and arrest someone, they can't force them to come in for questioning. Instead, Benny's lawyer arranged for him to take a private polygraph test, one paid for by Benny's mom. Detective Reese thinks the fact that the Johnsons are one of the wealthier families in a town this small is notable. Has his family being prominent in town played a role? I would say that it probably has because it's a small town, small town politics would come into play. And it seems very odd as an investigator that you would have somebody that has made multiple statements of his involvement and nothing has really been done. 
Why haven't you interviewed Benny Johnson? We attempted to interview Benny Johnson last year. Uh, he is represented by an attorney, and the attorney said that he would come in and he would give a statement, and that would pretty much be the end of that. And why not have him come in with his lawyer and give a statement? You know, not even be able to ask questions. Um, if we know what he's going to say when he's coming in, it, it's, uh, to me, it, it, in a lot of ways, it's a waste of time. People can get lawyers. It's absolutely your constitutional right to get a lawyer. But as law enforcement, you then reach out to the lawyer and say, I'd like to set up a time to talk to your client. The lawyer will come in and they're going to say, don't answer that question or do answer that question, but you at least try. People were getting frustrated because they kept saying, we know who did it. We don't understand. Why haven't they arrested them? Because Benny had eluded law enforcement for all these years and the fact that his name just kept coming up, we decided to try to track him down. We are going to visit Benny Johnson. We're being cautious, uh, but the plan is to just knock on his door and hopefully get him to talk to us. Okay, so I think it's this White House right here. The shades are drawn, no cars in front. But let's give it a try. I mean, there's a dog. Yes. So someone lives here. All right, we're going to try the other address. That is like completely empty inside. Anything? Uh, no, it's vacant. I think it's just an abandoned place. People are squatting. We were looking for Benny. You know if he's around? Yes. We were looking for somebody who has this down as their address. Benny Johnson. We don't know Benny Johnson. All right, next stop. <laughs> Striking out. <laughs> Striking out. We're out of stops, huh? Yep. <sighs> Disconnected phone lines. Vacant homes. Wrong addresses. As we were trying to track down Benny, People kept pointing us toward one of his family members, whose past convictions include battery and intimidation. His name is Randy Cates. Randy Cates is an interesting person. Randy Cates is the cousin to Benny Johnson. Randy Cates is also someone that has confessed to people that he was involved in the disappearance and death of Denise Flum. Randy Cates has always been in trouble. He has always been in and out of jail. He's been in trouble for domestic violence. What's he like when you just see him out at a bar, for instance? I used to bartend here in Connorsville. Randy Cates would come in, and he was the life of the party. Everybody just loved him. He would dance around. He would buy everybody drinks. He would tip until he would start drinking. He would get irritated. He'd go from one extreme to the other. There have always been allegations that Randy has went around telling people that he helped murder Denise Flum. He was a part of it. He won't say that he's the one that did it, but he I've always heard that he was he helped. Randy has kind of made himself uh, a person of interest in this case just by doing the same thing, various kind of uh, drunken confessions. We've talked to Randy uh, on several occasions. He has denied any involvement with um, her disappearance. While we were filming, Detective Reese caught one of the biggest breaks in her investigation to date, a tip from one of Randy Cates' closest confidants. The witness asked to stay anonymous because they feared for their safety. We disguised their voice. Randy told me one night, and we'd been out there out drinking, and that night he sat down and just poured it out. She come out there, they picked her up, is what they were telling me. She'd hop in the vehicle with them, they took her back to um, a building on the property. On what property? It had a cement slab on it. 
and they the boys went there to drink and party. They were already partying and half drugged up anyhow, so when they brought her back to there, she seen all the drugs and started flipping out, and then they just was like, well, you're not going nowhere, and things escalated. What's the things that they tell you happened? So Vinny just flipped out. She's going to tell her dad, and she's going to tell him that. She was going to get them in trouble for what they did. And someone hit her first to keep her shut, and that's where it started. They hit her and beat her, and... It's okay. And they fed her to the hogs. And that, they, she screamed. And Randy said, he just would cover his ears and say he could hear her scream. No. I didn't ask questions. No, you're I just sat there going... You're, you're perfectly well, fine. I, my, I'm just sitting there thinking, that's it. They're both dangerous. Make sure you have some type of protection on you. We were hoping to chat with Randy for a minute. Several people have come to us and said, Randy Cates told us personally that he was involved in Denise Flum's murder. Detective Reese just uncovered a major confession in Denise Flum's case. It's a brutal story that a witness says they heard directly from Randy Cates, a well-known local who is Benny Johnson's cousin. We had heard similar allegations from other locals. If true, it would implicate both of them in Denise's disappearance. We decided to confront him directly. So we are planning to uh, go door knock Randy Cates. Okay. Anything we should keep in mind safety-wise? They're both dangerous, so make sure you have some type of protection on you. Hello? Oh, we lost her. No service out here. Okay, this is his house on the corner here. No trespassing. Doesn't look like anyone's home. Okay, wait. These, these shades are open. chat with Randy for a minute. I'm Gianna. This is Nicole. Randy. Pleasure. Hi there. Um, we actually just came from Cincinnati. I see your shirt oh, yeah? there. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> We're doing a documentary on the Denise Flum case. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, did you know Denise back in the day? I didn't know. Uh, I know her dad. Okay, okay. Would you be open to doing like a, an actual interview with us on camera? We're just Let trying to... Okay, sure. We'll be back in like, what, five minutes? Is that cool? Uh, yeah, that'll work. Okay. What was it like when Denise Flum went missing? Um, it was pretty chaotic. There's people talking stuff everywhere, you know. It seemed like they were kind of jumping to conclusions on stuff, you know. Pretty much everyone we talked to, when you asked what they were doing, on that date in 1986, they'll tell you. Can you tell me where you were, what you were doing? I know I was in Detroit. Um, I don't know the exact date or the exact time or anything like that, but... Do you remember being here when the search parties were going on? I don't know that either. Several people have come to us and said, Randy Cates told us personally that he was involved in Denise Flum's murder. It's definitely not. Definitely not. Do you have any recollection of ever talking about being involved in any way with this murder? Recollection as far as? You telling people that you were involved? No. No. Who do you think killed Denise? It's, a, it's like a, it's a mystery. It's, it gives me just creeps just you know, talking about it. 
Yeah. They were trying to get my cousin for it and stuff because he said some stuff about uh, he had something to do with it. Your cousin, is that Benny? Yeah. Did Benny ever say to you that he did it? He did, uh, but he was joking around, you know. I, I just can't, I just, there's no possibility he could have done this. Why do you think he was telling people that he did it? Because he's all messed up on that weed. A lot of people smoking weed, not a lot of people confessing yeah, now, to murdering people. Now, yeah. I tell you, the, the way he would joke about it, because they were on his butt so bad, they would just uh, kind of just like a laughing way. And what did he you know, say? I'm not, I'm not trying to cover his, his butt, but I just, I know him, you know, and he just thought that stuff was kind of funny at the time, it's, and it's not. So, like, what would he say? He only did one time to me. He was behind my mom's bar. He said something about it. But it was in a nonchalant, you know, BSM way. What did you say back to Benny? To go oh, that night? Well, someone tells you they killed someone. Like, what do you say oh, back? Oh, no. I just, I, I just look like, just, you know, I just cannot see. Not, he's his family. Just, I cannot see him ever doing anything stupid like that. Randy didn't implicate himself or his cousin, but he wasn't exactly convincing either, and many people in town were more skeptical. Detective Reese pointed us toward another key witness, one of the closest people to Benny Johnson back then, a woman he was dating when Denise disappeared. I dated Benny Johnson. I knew his sister Erica, and he was very nice. Attractive, drove a nice car. <laughs> That's about all you need when you're 16. <laughs> they were having a party at their cabin next to their mother's house. How close in time was this to, to when Denise disappeared? Oh, it was probably the same week, right after, just a day or two. Because I remember the conversation there was about Denise. We were there early, Benny and I. We were there early to clean up because, of course, it's a cabin. It's dirty and dusty and old. and So we were cleaning up before the party, and there was um, blood in the cabin. What? Mm -hmm. This yeah. is the day after Denise disappeared, mm -hmm. and there's blood in the cabin? Yeah. How much? I, I'm not clear. I don't remember. I've tried to remember that, and I can't remember. The explanation I got was that someone had had an encounter with a boy the night before for the first time. Like someone lost their virginity and yes. blood as a result of it. Yes, and I felt like it was more than that should have been. Someone mopped it up, whoever it was. I don't know who. Did you get the sense that the blood was from something recent? It was definitely recent. Mm -hmm. They said that that had happened the night before. Wow. I did tell the investigators about it, of course. I gave them that information 32 years ago, and they did nothing with it. Why? I just wanted to like ask you a couple questions about the Denise Flum case. People should stay for the only goddamn business. We've been chasing any information to corroborate the stories we've been hearing about Benny Johnson. According to these court records, investigators eventually obtained a warrant to search the Johnson cabin. But it wasn't until more than five years after Denise disappeared, when a new task force of officers formed to take a fresh look at the case. They asked for an outside prosecutor because Cheryl Johnson, Benny's mom, was a quote, close personal friend to the Fayette County prosecutor at the time. This request for the search warrant details what officers were looking for, but the list of items collected, if any, is missing from the court file. It feels like the questions about Benny keep multiplying. Finding him seemed like the only way to possibly get some answers. So we hit the road again, in search of Benny, this time with new information. We've tried to find Benny Johnson uh, with no luck. We've gone on wild goose chases. We've shown up to any address that we can find connected to his name. Um, but one of our closest sources got his current address. It's early morning right now. We're trying to catch him before his family has an opportunity to throw up a barricade, which we've been told many times before is what they've done for the past 35 years. Moment. 
how you doing? Not bad. Cool. My name's Gianna. Hi, this is Nicole. Hi. Hello. So sorry to bother you. All right. We are working on a film right now, and we were just wanted to like ask you a couple questions just about growing up in Connorsville and a little bit about the uh, the Denise Flum case. Um, is it? W would you be open to that? I'd like to have somebody present with me, not one I move by with with me present. I, I, that is just calling me. That is giving me so much trouble, and it's, you know, I don't know why it, it, that should be over with. Mm -hmm. Why do you think, I know, well, why, why do you think it has followed you this many years later? I'd rather not speak about this here. Right, we understand. Can I just maybe sit outside on the porch for a couple minutes? No, this upsets me. Why does it upset you? Because I've tried to put this in my past, and people just keep rehashing. I'll tell you. People should stick to their own goddamn business. Okay, can I just, can I mention one more thing, Benny? I mean, I, I, I'm a friendly person, a nice person, mm -hmm. a for people. Yeah. You know, that's what I understand. Figure out why you didn't be, you want to be wrapped up or something like that. Well, to be honest, it's because a lot of a lot of people have told us that you confess so, to them. I mean, what's their name? Uh, no, because they're actually scared of you. Okay. Well, we're sorry to bother you. Reach out anytime if yeah. you want to talk. Thanks. Holy shit, that guy is scary. He just looks like that dude has been through hell and back. And he was pissed off and he kept coming toward us and oh, wow, he was just a scary dude. As soon as we mentioned Denise Flum, something switched. He opened the door wearing sunglasses and then eventually took them off. And his eyes were just like, they just, they just kind of like gave you the chills a little bit. Like we've interviewed some of the, you know, most dangerous people in the world. And I, I, I can't remember ever being that sort of nervous around somebody. It's clear Benny's not going to talk to us, but the stories linking him to Denise's disappearance continue to weigh on the community and one involves a pond in Mary Grade Bird Sanctuary, just southwest of Connorsville. So a couple months after the disappearance, then he came to school to bring me lunch. He told me he wanted to show me something after school and he was taking me to the bird sanctuary. I wrote a letter to one of my very good friends and said, that if anything had happened to me, that I was with Benny, and that if I wasn't home by 4 p.m., that I was at Mary Greybird Sanctuary and they needed to send the police. What, why did you write those notes? That's not normal for a 16-year-old to, to write. Because to by that time, of course, they didn't think she was a runaway anymore. And you felt like your boyfriend was, at the very least, a dangerous person. Right, or I at least felt like he knew. We drove out to the bird sanctuary in his car, drove up the main drive, parked on the right, got out. I could see, like, cattails, so I assume it was around a pond. We kind of rounded that area and headed back toward a clearing between two sets of trees. But once we started to get to the other side, it looked darker because the trees were more dense. And I said, this is as far as I go. I wanted to know if something was back there that they needed to know, but I was not going any farther than that. What did you fear? Really think that he would have done anything to me, but I think I feared more <laughs> maybe what he was going to show me. Just to be specific, is what you're referring to, that you were afraid that maybe he would show you Denise's body? Something like that, yes. There was a tip that Denise was in a pond at Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary. So if these dogs hit on this pond, it's a huge deal. This could be it.
It's been a heartbreaking mystery in Fayette County since 1986. Whatever happened to Denise Flume? The search area is a good half mile off this road and hard to access, especially with the current wet conditions. It'll be at least three weeks before we get any word as to whether this is a true possible lead here at the Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary here in rural Fayette County. But it is a possibility. Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary, a sprawling 700-acre nature preserve, has been the subject of rumors since Denise Flum went missing in 1986. But the most damning story came from Benny's ex-girlfriend, who says that within two months of Denise disappearing, he brought her out there to show her something, but she was too nervous to find out what. State police started to search this area back in the 1980s, but the sheriff's office recently found records indicating that the search was never completed due to bad weather. Denise's remains have never been found. In this case, is it's so complicated in so many ways, it is like a big puzzle. And at this point, this late in the game, 35 years into the case, there's a lot of pieces missing to that puzzle that are kind of essential to putting everything together. Time is, is, is running out at this point with no real physical evidence, is, you know, a confession or discovering Denise's body are really the two big things. In 2018, they decided to revisit old rumored locations, this time with cadaver dogs. Where are we headed right now? We are headed out to a pond um, that has been rumored for quite some time as a possible um, spot where Denise was possibly placed. by really tall trees here, and it really feels like we're in the middle of nowhere. The stretch of land between here and the highway is all overgrown now, but back in 1986, it was a clear road. Detective Rick Wilcox from the city police had brought up the idea of getting cadaver dogs. I had the uh, Indiana Homeland Security's canines came here, I called them up and was like, hey, what, what would it take to get you people up here? And, and they voluntarily came. I believe it is possible that Denise, her remains are still in that pond. Cadaver dogs are trained to pick up the scent of human remains, even decades after someone has been buried. So if these dogs hit on this pond, it's a huge deal. It means that there are human remains, you know, wherever they lay down or uh, give their expression of a hit. dogs independently indicated in the same exact spot. It was the biggest break in the case to date. Oh my gosh, maybe, maybe, just maybe this is where she's at. We knew this was it. It was finally time for this to end. This could be it. If we have to make a deal with someone, then we're going to make it to get the answers.
After cadaver dogs detected the scent of human remains at the Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary, dozens of volunteers and officers worked overtime without pay to drain and excavate the pond. What started as a hopeful search quickly turned into one riddled with challenges. We started draining the pond with a pump. Unfortunately, at that time, it decided to rain, I think, 30 days straight. As we made progress forward, every time it rained, the pond would fill right back up. So it made it extremely difficult to do what we wanted to do. So we pretty much dug the whole area where the dog was indicating on, put it in the back of a dump trailer, and we sifted it through all by hand. We went through 15 to 20 huge trailer beds full of mud by hand, looking for anything. We knew this was it. It was finally time for this to end. It was nonstop. People out there 24 seven searching. We were, you know, maybe this is something, maybe this is something. And we unfortunately didn't find anything. And we didn't find nothing. We concluded that there was nothing in the pond. Since the beginning, over all these years, it's it's been a roller coaster. You're up, and then it was nothing. So that's what our life has been. As far as Denise's case, that's the roller coaster. Well, back to square one again. It gets old. (laughs) But that's part of this game we're playing. We just... you, You go on. You just have to. With this case, there's no closure. She's just gone and no one has ever had to face anything for that and they've never found her she's just in the wind somewhere just it's such a devastating thing for the family to have to endure developing news after searching for answers for 34 years What is the truth about what you know about Denise Plummer? If they don't find a body, they want to know what happened to her. They want to know where she was. We're going to try to make a contact with Ben Johnson Sr. There's another twist in this case. Tell me one time, look me in the eye and tell me one time, and I'm done. I won't ask you that question again. Did you kill Denise Plummer? Yes, I did. 